Homage to the Buddha, homage to the Dharma, homage to the Sangha. So, um, good morning everyone and uh, welcome. We're celebrating today or remembering or honoring all those who have died in war and continue to die in war. And uh, I've been reflecting on the Buddha's teaching on this subject. I was reluctant even to approach this subject for a talk because in my past I had some very strong views and the residue of those is still with me. Um, So I had to sit with it for a while before I determined that I could um, reflect on the Buddha's teaching and stick with that and perhaps my views would be, um, would take it easy. (laughs) So last week we celebrated the very joyful occasion of Vesak, the Buddha's life, enlightenment, teaching, and death. And um, reflecting on the Buddha's teaching on war and peace, um, it occurred to me that he was, uh, as he was sitting on the, under the Bodhi tree, he, he fought the battle with the armies of Mara, as we call it, symbolically, all the forces that tend to pull us away from having a peaceful heart and acting from a peaceful heart. Greed, anger, and delusion in all their various forms. Quite dramatic in the um, rendition of it that we read. So in looking at the Buddha's teaching, I um, also thought about Reverend Master Jiyu, because she was the one who gave us this ceremony and wrote some of the music for it. And um, I reflected on how she lived through World War II as a young woman, a teenager, and um, she had many friends killed. She lived through bombings. And after the war, she entered into Buddhist training as she described herself in the wild white goose, an angry young woman, asking the question, why should death and cruelty exist? She went to the Far East and immersed herself in Buddhist training, and during that time she found her way to the true question that she was carrying deep in her heart, When was the first arising of selfishness? So there was a movement from looking outward and responding to the conditions, the terrible conditions of warfare and loss that she endured in World War II, to turning inward and looking at those conditions within herself that she could do something about. And then she set about to do it. Um, So the Buddha and Reverend Master Jiyu both um, had a question. The Buddha's question, of course, was suffering. What is the reason for suffering? And it seems to me that Reverend Master Jiyu's question was a variation of that same question. Myself, reflecting on this, I don't want to go into too much about myself, but a little bit about the background that I came from being born soon after that war that Reverend Master Jiyu endured. One of my first um, recollections is seeing on TV at a very young age video footage of a bomb testing that we were still doing in those days, way back in the early 50s, uh, a thermonuclear bomb being tested, exploding and going off, the big explosion and the mushroom cloud. That image stayed with me, and basically my childhood was somewhat lived under the shadow of that mushroom cloud. We got to conduct drills each, uh, every so often in school where we got under our desk and held our hands over our heads in case of a nuclear attack, which also seemed to me completely insane. Um, I didn't know how I could trust the adult world as a child and do what they told me to do, when they would have me do something so 
seemingly ludicrous to me as duck under my desk and put my hands on my head to protect myself from a thermonuclear explosion. (laughs) But, you know, as I grew up and grew older and grew more mature, I hope, a little bit, um, I have begun to see that we don't do everything out of rational behavior. Um, So I was also, as I came of age, an angry young woman. I was angry about war, too, and I considered myself, although not an activist, a dedicated supporter of the anti-war movement and the peace movement. First, it was disarmament. When I was first um, sort of engaging in some protests, it was ban the bomb. And then it went into that, and it went into civil rights marches and the like, and into anti-Vietnam War marches and protests. So I was angry, and I was looking to change the conditions that angered me by changing the external conditions, forcing those in power to see the the rightness of my point of view and do something about it. And uh, my question that I had at that time was, why do these horrors of um, warfare, nuclear proliferation, racial and social discrimination, why do these horrors continue when we should know better? And eventually that question led to another one, how do I make peace in my own heart? Reading some work by the Dalai Lama, the way he put it was, on the subject of disarmament. We all individually create the conditions for warfare. We can do something about it by disarming ourselves internally. And that is to free ourselves from the greed, hatred, and delusion that lie at the root of war and other harmful behaviors. So, In order to reflect on this, I've uh, always been moved by the lovely piece of music called Simha's Questions that we sang this morning. Because these were questions. Reverend Master Ji, you had a question. Shakyamuni Buddha had a question. I had a question. These questions. Why is this? What is the right thing to do? How to find true peace? So when I turned uh, to this teaching that um, led to this beautiful piece of music, I found some uh, verses that came from the Pali scriptures, the early teachings of the Buddha. And the first thing I found is actually in the Dhammapada, which is a little collection of verses from the Buddha's teachings, which is the basic teaching. Cease to do evil, cultivate that which is good, purify the heart. This is the way of the awakened ones. If it sounds familiar, we have the three pure precepts, cease from evil, do only good, and do good for others. This is the version as it appears in the early scriptures. General Simha, the subject of the piece of music we sang today, was a general in the time of the Buddha, and he belonged to a different sect, a different religious sect. And they taught a slightly different view of things. At a certain time, he heard of the Buddha's teaching, and he decided to go and talk to the Buddha. And after a couple of tries, when his own teacher prevented him from, uh, suggested it wouldn't be a good idea to go see the Buddha, he finally got to see the Buddha. And... um, He asked the Buddha um, whether the Buddha's teaching meant the annihilation of the the annihilation of oneself, the contemptibleness of all things, doing away of the soul, burning away of man's being. Was this the Buddha's teaching? Um, And the Buddha answered to this question that. In one way, this is true, and in another way, uh, the opposite is true. So from there, you see the Buddha laying out a third, what Reverend Master Ji, you called a third position. Uh, 
two parallel, seemingly parallel truths that can come together in one great truth. The Buddha said to Simha, I teach Simha the not doing of such actions as are unrighteous, in other words, ceasing from evil, either by deed or by word or by thought. I teach the not bringing about of all those conditions of heart which are evil and not good. However, I teach Simha the doing of such actions as are righteous by deed, by word, and by thought. I teach the bringing about of all those conditions of heart which are good and not evil. And in case um, someone is new to our tradition here, the word evil in Buddhism means something that causes suffering. Thoughts, deeds, words that cause suffering is, is what we mean by evil. So basically the Buddha taught Sima the three pure precepts and then General Sima asked the question specifically about war. As a soldier, he asked the Buddha, does the Tathagata, who teaches kindness and compassion, permit the punishment of the criminal? Does he declare that it's wrong to go to war to protect home, family, and property? Does he teach the doctrine of a complete self-surrender so that I should suffer the evildoer to do what he pleases and yield submissively to him who threatens to take by violence what is my own? And those are good questions because those are the reasons that people take up violence and go to war. Someone breaks into your house. A per- someone breaks into a person's house. The person's impulse is to defend oneself and one's family and one's property against someone who has a harmful intention there. Um, So, human beings, I, I was looking at a lovely book just before I came here about friendships in the animal world. And each little um, chapter had um, a description of the scientific nomenclature of each kind of animal, and including the human one. And so when I think of this, the kind of response that wants to protect and wants to defend and wants to maintain survival at all costs, fear, this is a part of the human um, being's animal heritage. Um, We still, you know, our brains, the scientists say, have evolved from the brains of animals. And so we maintain the desire to survive, the desire to reproduce our kind, and do the things that we need to do in order to, uh, to achieve those things. So... So Simha asks, is it, does the Buddha t- teach that it's okay to go to war and to punish the criminal in, in you know, certain circumstances? The Buddha answered, he who deserves punishment must be punished, and he who is worthy of favor must be favored. Yet, at the same time, he teaches to do no injury to any living being, but to be full of love and kindness. He goes on to say these injunctions are not contradictory. For whosoever must be punished for the crimes which he has committed suffers his injury not through the ill will of the judge, but on account of his own evil actions, which is the Buddha stating the law of karma. One reaps the fruit which we sow by our actions. So the Buddha has taken Simha's question from the material realm to the spiritual realm. So it's a little different focus here. In the material realm, we seek as as human members of the animal kingdom to preserve ourselves, to reproduce ourselves, to get the food we need, to find shelter and such things. There's nothing wrong with that. The Buddha is just shifting the focus a little bit to the spiritual realm 
which has a different type, in which we have a different type of focus. To do only good, to cease from evil, to purify our hearts. So we're going into that realm with the Buddha. He continues to say specifically about warfare, the Tathagata teaches that all warfare in which man tries to slay his brother is lamentable. He does not teach that those who go to war in a righteous cause, after having exhausted all means to preserve the peace, are blameworthy. So that's his teaching specifically on war. And I found it interesting that he says that Uh, warfare in which a man tries to slay his brother is lamentable. He doesn't say it's wrong. He doesn't say it's, uh, he, he doesn't say right or wrong, good or evil, good or bad. He says it's lamentable, indeed. And for those who go to war in a righteous cause, he uh, says after having exhausted all means to preserve the peace, are not blameworthy. He doesn't say right or wrong, should or shouldn't, must or mustn't. Uh, It is necessary to be careful when discerning a righteous cause. Because um, I remember Reverend Master Jiu teaching us that a violent response or a response of warfare is only rarely, in very rare circumstances, I don't even know what to say, okay, good, no, but that it would only occur in rare circumstances. Um, So in discerning what's a righteous cause, to be careful and be aware, is there even a trace of greed, wanting something, wanting to cling to something, clinging to survival, clinging to one's family, property, or national ideals? Is there even a trace of hatred, aversion, not wanting something? And then delusion, which is more subtle. And for me, it often takes the form of fear. Is there even a trace of fear in one's response? Um, My response to seeing the nuclear bomb test was terror, horror, uh, fear. So if I had reacted to that, I would have been reacting out of fear. And, you know, in in a sense, the activities I joined in with to uh, sort of try to make an end of those things were, were somewhat motivated by fear. The Buddha goes on to say about warfare, um, the, the beginning of the stanza I'll go back to, so there's the whole thing. He teaches that all warfare in which man tries to slay his brother is lamentable. He does not teach that those who go to war in a righteous cause, after having exhausted all means to preserve the peace, are blameworthy. He must be blamed who is the cause of war. And I stopped and scratched my head there for a moment because it took me a little while to figure out, well, who's the cause of war? And then I remembered what the Dalai Lama's writing had said, which is, each one of us, within our own hearts, has the potential for being, bringing about the conditions that are the cause of war. So, who is the cause of war? Well, uh, let it not be me. So, therefore, what do I have to do? Um, It could be me, as long as I perpetuate thought, word, and deed based on greed, anger, and delusion. So what the Dalai Lama suggested is that as individuals, we disarm ourselves internally. And the way we do this is through restraint. When we, we're all subject to what the Dalai Lama calls afflictive emotions. Things like hatred, greed, lust, envy, jealousy, resentment. You know what they are. We all know what they are. So that we use restraint when we see those um, impulses arise in our minds. Our practice is to watch the mind. We cultivate awareness that grows more and more discerning in 
snaring these little impulses that come up and making the choice not to do them, not to continue with the angry line of thought, not to say the angry word, and so on. Um, For me, I like to start with greed, starting with not grabbing the biggest cookie on the cookie plate. I mean, this was a good teaching for me. I've said it before. I had the habit when I came to the monastery of always looking when we had cookies, always taking time to look for which cookie was the biggest and then taking that one. Well, when there were so many monks here, it would kind of hold up the process, you know. Well, which one is it? (laughs) And one of my sister monks very kindly suggested that I could just take the one closest to me. (laughs) And so I started doing that, and it's really been helpful. I no longer get all worked up about whether I got the biggest cookie or not. And that's a silly example. It does, uh, you know, it can be applied to other things that aren't quite so silly. Um, And I don't know what the, I don't have any examples of those right off the top of my head, but you you know what they are. So we disarm ourselves internally through countering our afflictive thoughts and emotions. We have to be willing to give them up. With anger, for example, the Buddha described anger as having poison roots and a honeyed tip, an arrow with poison roots and a honeyed tip. Well, the honey is that it feels good sometimes to vent one's anger. I I think it does anyway. And since people... Vent anger. There must be some reward in it. So um, we need to be willing to let go of the good feeling we get from blasting somebody maybe in a political office or maybe in our workplace or maybe in our family or even blasting them internally with thoughts. Um, That's a hard one for me to give up and it's a work in progress. Um, We have to cultivate, on the other hand, the positive qualities such as charity, tenderness, benevolence, sympathy, loving kindness, equanimity, and so on. Patient endurance being one of the chief among them. We have to be willing to accept the suffering that comes our way in order to... um, We have to accept it that if suffering comes our way, it's the fruit of some previous action. And therefore, the the helpful response is to willingly endure it. Um, The Buddha said to General Simha, he said that struggle must be, for all life is a struggle of some kind, but he that struggles should look to it In other words, be aware, lest he struggle in the interest of self. So if suffering comes to us or the occasion of struggle comes to us, to be able to be still and be certain that we aren't responding in the interest of self. So, easily said, not so easily done. So, disarming ourselves internally. Uh, This is very satisfying to me because it helps me with the idea that, you know, I must do something about these awful things such as war and nuclear bombs and the like. Yes, I must do something. I must disarm myself internally by letting go of my desires to act on anger, greed, fear, jealousy, and so on and by cultivating the positive qualities of loving kindness and tenderness and others. So awareness is key to this. We practice awareness when we sit on our cushion. We sit there and allow the thoughts and feelings to come and go, being aware of them and not running off with them. And when we find that we've run off with them, we bring ourselves back and do this Many times. By doing this, we cultivate awareness. I read an article in a Buddhist magazine where a gentleman, uh, a lay teacher, was talking about developing and strengthening our awareness muscle. Oh, he was trying to quit smoking, and he made himself a little bargain. 
He said he could smoke, but first, before he smoked, he carried a little notebook and he had to write down the occasion when he wanted to smoke. And then it was fine for him to go ahead and smoke, but he had to write down the impulse that led to the desire to smoke. And he found that over time that helped him quit smoking because he was developing his awareness muscle. Um, I thought that was a good way to approach it, by developing the awareness rather than saying, you must not smoke. Okay. Um, so this is this uh, period of reflection on this subject has really been helpful for me. I've never been of the inclination to actually go out there and do battle on a battlefield. Um, all people all have different temperaments. And although I enjoy a good football game on TV from time to time, um, it isn't my inclination to go out there and play that game or to go out there on a battlefield and fight with others. Um, I've been more of a fearful. I've I've had a more fearful and withdrawing temperament. Um, And so, you know, I haven't um, responded to the horrors of war and anger and so on, um, so much by going out and fighting as by bearing ill will in my heart towards others. The supreme irony in my life that I can give you as an example, and I'm embarrassed to say this, is that during the Vietnam War in the late 60s, uh, I lived in an apartment where I had a dartboard on the wall, and I enjoyed the game of throwing darts, you know, and... Uh, competing with my housemates about who could throw them more accurately. And at a certain point, I put a photograph of one of the top generals from the Vietnam War onto the dartboard because I was really angry about that war. I did not get the irony (laughs) that I was attacking uh, someone because I was angry about war. Later on, I grew up a little bit more after that, (laughs) I would hope. But um, so for me, the struggle is with the greed, hatred, and especially with the fear in my own heart. Whether the external conditions be in the midst of a thermonuclear bomb attack or in a time of peace, prosperity, and enjoyment. I'll just read a couple of things from this little book on the Buddha's teachings on social and communal Harmony, and that will be the end. Um, This has always been a helpful piece of scripture for me. The Buddha is teaching to his monks, even if bandits were to sever you savagely limb by limb with a two-handled saw, he who gave rise to a mind of hate toward them would not be carrying out my teaching. And I've often reflected on this and thought to myself, if someone were sawing me me limb from limb with a two-handed saw, saw, what would my heart be filled with? Well, I can't say that it would be filled with loving kindness. However, I can cherish the aspiration that it be filled with loving kindness and I can practice loving kindness. So instead of someone sawing me limb from limb with a two-handled saw, if the monk next to me at the table is slurping their soup or, you know, the minor annoyances that arise in daily life, if the politicians are spouting words that are just causing me extreme um, discomfort, then is a chance to practice filling my heart with loving kindness and letting go of the hatred that naturally arises on those occasions. And hatred includes irritation, annoyance, resentment, and so on. So, the Buddha continues, Herein, monks, you should train thus. Our minds will remain unaffected, and we shall utter no evil words. We shall abide compassionate for their welfare with a mind of loving-kindness, without inner hate. We shall abide pervading them with a mind imbued with loving-kindness. And starting with them, we shall abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving-kindness, 
abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. That is how you should train. And that's the aspiration today on Memorial Day for me. Thank you.